1. Kevin Race Kevin Race was a business owner in Woolrich, Maine, who went missing in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. On the 9th of September, 2007, a car belonging to Kevin Race was found in a parking lot of the Appalachian Mountain Club at the bottom of Mount Washington at the beginning of Route 16. Mount Washington is often referred to as the most dangerous small mountain in the world. With a height of only 6,288 feet, it pales in comparison to some of the many large mountains on Earth. However, many mountaineers have cited its frigid conditions and Arctic-level winds, which have reached over 230 miles an hour, as the reasoning behind the signs placed all about the trail warning hikers of grave danger. Kevin was taking a basic EMT class so that he could join Doctors Without Borders to help people in third world countries. He was an experienced and enthusiastic outdoors man who owned a successful rope company, Custom Cordage. However, he had recently come into some legal troubles having to do with his business and was indicted on charges of embezzling $250,000 from his and his partner's company. He was due for his first court appearance two days after he went missing. According to Fish and Game investigators, a note was found at Kevin's home, which led investigators to believe he was, quote, looking for his final resting place. Months after Kevin's disappearance, in January of 2008, Kevin's business partner filed an additional lawsuit alleging Kevin to now have embezzled over $500,000 from January of 2002 until the time he vanished in September of 2007, indicating he may have stolen a large amount of cash prior to disappearing. While some cite Kevin's money troubles and this note as evidence of a possible suicide, a friend of Kevin's says he was the type of guy to quote, always have a plan, and he thinks Kevin may have taken the EMT classes and done this preparation in order to live off the grid. Fellow hikers last saw Kevin at Tuckerman Shelter, which is about two miles from the top of the mountain at around 2.30 p.m. that Sunday. Despite the use of search and rescue units, law enforcement canine units, and a U.S. National Guard Black Hawk helicopter, no evidence of Kevin or his remains were ever found. 2. Randy Doyle Parscale Jr. Randy, then 10 years old and a third grader at Roberts Elementary School, was hiking in Pepper Sauce Canyon near Oracle with his father and other family members. Randy was mere feet ahead of the family members, exploring slightly ahead of the rest of the group. As he turned around a bend on the trail, he simply vanished, despite the fact that family members turned onto the same bend a minute later and then began rushing around to see where he went seconds after that. While multiple law enforcement units were dispatched to look for Randy within minutes of his disappearance, including canine units and helicopters, Randy was never seen again. Theories about Randy's disappearance ranged from kidnapping to falling down one of the old mine shafts in the area. The only clue was the bull's eye footprints that Randy had seemingly left, tracked by an experienced rescue worker who was able to follow the footprints until they abruptly ended at a remote dirt road. Also on this road, was the imprint of tire tracks, which investigators thought could indicate Randy was picked up by a vehicle. In 1985, more than six years after Randy's disappearance, a woman told investigators she had found a dollar bill with the words, I'm alive in Phoenix, Arizona. Help me, Randy Parscale. The bill was investigated but turned up no further clues. Four years after that, a man working a construction site using Parscale's social security number was rumored to match the description of the age progression photos of Randy. His father went to Phoenix to investigate the claim, but the mysterious man was no longer employed at the work site. The construction worker was never located, and his identity has not been confirmed. Classified by police as a non-family abduction, Randy is still missing to this day. Justin Alexander Shelter, 35, quit his successful job at a tech startup company in order to travel full-time. He called it retiring. 
but it was more like reverting back to an earlier world. Relying on the knowledge he picked up after leaving high school at the age of 16 to study wilderness survival in the art of karate, he traveled 18,000 miles across the western side of the United States. Justin experienced a significant setback in Sun Valley, Nevada, where he mistakenly trusted a stranger to provide him shelter and a much-needed shower, and instead had all of his belongings stolen by a man who was actually part of a group of meth heads. After that loss, Justin set out to discover a more simple life. Already with no possessions, he decided to go to the extreme. For his new life, he traveled to India and wore a simple bark loincloth, went hunting alongside indigenous tribes, and all the while traced the path of the ancient god of Shiva. His blog, Adventures of Justin, chronicles a life many commented they envied, Posting pictures of his treks in the snow wearing duct tape sandals and living in caves, Justin would caption pictures with statements such as, quote, going tribal with the Medawani of Indonesia, and, quote, I'm free to live the life of my dreams. But those posts came to an end with the last one, posted on August 19th, 2016, reading, in part, quote, a sadhu has invited me on a pilgrimage high in the Himalayas to meditate. I ran out of money and food, so he fed me each time I passed. He invited me along on his pilgrimage, three days hard trek to a lake at 13,000 feet, and then 10 days meditating in a spiritual retreat." End quote. Justin described the sadhu's eyes as, quote, 5,000 years old and those eyes were one of their only forms of communication, as this guru was supposedly a mute. Due to a post on Justin's Instagram referencing these sadhus, or gurus, his family has reason to be concerned that this man had a hand in Justin's disappearance. Justin wrote on his post, They can bless or curse. Police won't arrest them, even for murder, which happens, I'm told. I've been cold, damp, and hungry a lot recently, and feeling a bit malnourished and weak already. I should return in mid-September or so. If I'm not back by then, don't look for me." Justin's willingness to go into rough mountainous terrain of Himachal Pradesh, North India, despite a back injury that was flaring up, a vitamin deficiency, and a general fatigue, shows a man so determined to find a higher truth that he risks dying to find it. This particular area was a draw to him, as it was believed to have been the meditation location of the son of the god Shiva, who meditated there for 3,000 years. Additionally, the hot springs there were said to have healing properties. Justin left with the Nepalese Nagababa, named Sataya Narayan Rawat, on or around August 24th and on September 3rd, he was seen coming back down from the Montalai Lake, going towards a village by some tourists. They said Justin was walking alone, and that the guru had walked past a few hours earlier. The hikers offered Justin, who looked haggard and unwell, some food and a respite from his trek, but he was highly determined to reach his belongings, which were stored in the village below. Justin's Instagram post about the gurus being untouchable by police was proven untrue as upon Justin's family sounding the alarm, the police did end up arresting the guru that he traveled with on October 15th, six weeks after Justin was last seen. Police interrogated the guru for eight days, at which point they left him alone for but a few minutes, only to come back to the room to find he had hanged himself, using the only thing he had on him, his torn and dirty loincloth. Many followers of his ideology say it was not guilt but embarrassment that caused this guru to take his life upon being questioned about his missing hiking partner. Despite forensic teams combing the countryside and rough terrain for any side of Justin or his remains, they found nothing. Some think Justin had a fall and crawled into some sort of ditch or ravine to wait to be found, while others believe he encountered foul play from either the guru or some other person unknown. Others comment on the area's reputation for being a popular hashish destination, enticing Western tourists with hash-fueled enlightenment, which can bring with it a potentially criminal enterprise. Justin may have been in the wrong place at the wrong time or witnessed a drug deal gone bad. Justin is still missing to this day, and his family has spent considerable time and energy looking for him. D. 
David Snedden At the time of his disappearance, David Snedden was a 24-year-old university student from the United States studying in Beijing over the summer of 2004. Snedden was taking a Mandarin class and had previously learned Korean while studying as a Mormon missionary in South Korea. In August, after his class finished, he decided he would travel around western China for a few weeks before going to Seoul to meet his older brother Michael on August 26th. If you never hear from me again, look for my body in the western Yunnan province of China or the Yellow Mountains of Anhui, joked David in an email to his mother prior to his disappearance. His jests were proven tragically prophetic when the emails ceased. The Snedens weren't initially worried that David hadn't contacted them in two weeks, believing he was in a remote area which lacked internet access. On August 26th, however, they received a phone call from Michael in South Korea. David had never arrived. After authorities couldn't find his body, Chinese authorities theorized that he fell to his death hiking near Tiger Leap Gorge. That had happened to hikers in the area before, but, unlike David, their bodies eventually turned up. David's father and his brother went to China to retrace his last steps and found a dozen witnesses who had spoken to David after he had made it safely through the gorge. In 2011, the Snedens received a phone call from Chuck Downs, a Pentagon official who suspected that David might have been abducted by North Korean agents. The next year, Narkin announced that a North Korean defector in China reported that a university student from the United States was arrested by authorities in August of 2004 for helping North Korean refugees. He was released the next month, but instead was handed over to five North Korean agents. Authorities fear he has been taken hostage by North Korean soldiers looking to indoctrinate foreigners or use them as spies. Others believe David encountered an accident or danger on the trail. Nine years later, the family still believes David to be alive somewhere. Paula Weldon On the afternoon of December 1, 1946, Bennington College sophomore Paula Weldon came back from her dorm room after working at the dining hall and told her roommate she was going out for a brief hike as a quote, study break, and then left campus, heading up a trail near Glatzenberry Mountain. Dressed in a red parka coat with fur-lined hood, blue jeans, topsider shoes with thick soles, and a gold Elgin wristwatch with a black band, she made no indication that she planned on staying gone for very long. Danny Fager, who owned a gas station near the college gates, said he spotted Paula, he said he had seen her run up and then down the side of the gravel pit near the entrance of the college around 2.45 p.m. Fifteen minutes later, Weldon was hitchhiking near the Bennington campus when a passing motorist picked her up. She told him she was going to hike on the long trail off Route 9 near Glatzenbury Mountain. The driver dropped her off on Route 9 about three miles from her destination. Several others saw her that day walking on the trail. The last confirmed sighting of Weldon was at 4 p.m. that day when she spoke to a man on the trail and asked him how far it extended. He told her it went all the way to Canada. The sun set at around 5 p.m. and it began snowing a few hours after that, accumulating three inches. When she hadn't returned by the time her roommate went to bed, the roommate assumed Paula was pulling a late night of studying at the college library. But the roommate became concerned the next morning when it was clear that Paula had never returned to her dorm room. The roommate contacted college officials who organized a small search party to look for Paula Jean somewhere within the extensive campus grounds. When the college couldn't locate Paula, they called the local police. An extensive search of the long trail and its environments turned up no sign of Weldon and no significant clues. The search was hampered by the fact that Vermont had no state police at the time. Eventually, officials from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York stepped in to help. Investigators found a man who stated that he had seen Paula soon before her disappearance. This young man became a suspect 
when he told differing stories about where he had spent the evening of December 1st. Allegedly, he also told at least two friends that he knew where Paulo was buried. He later claimed that he was only kidding around. Investigators initially believed Weldon had gotten lost in the mountains and died of exposure, but as time passed without their finding any sign of her, they began to consider other theories. Authorities began to suspect that Paula's father had something to do with his daughter's disappearance. It came to light that he did not approve of a boy Paula had been seeing. He claimed this boyfriend had to be the responsible party, but his only proof came from a clairvoyant. Although there were reports that Paula was somewhat depressed at the time of her disappearance, her family and friends said she had only normal problems for a girl her age and was not unhappy enough to commit suicide or run away from home. She left all her belongings behind, and her family stated she was not the type of person to leave without warning. Then, nine years later, a lumberjack came forward, saying he knew where Paula's body was buried. After being questioned, he eventually admitted to making it up for publicity. Then, in 1968, a skeleton was found. It was later determined it was far too old to be Paula. There is no hard evidence of foul play in Weldon's disappearance, but many people believe she was murdered and buried somewhere in or near the Long Trail. Weldon's disappearance remains unsolved. There has been no indication of her whereabouts since 1946.